This is the Minnesota Paradox, uh, a discussion about racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for, for joining us. I am Kelly Mitchell and I am the Executive Director of the Robina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice here at the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, the Robina Institute does research in sentencing, probation, and parole with the goal of making transformative change in criminal justice. Um, I am also the chair of the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, joining me today to talk about racial disparities in the criminal justice system, we have a great panel. We have uh, Judge Todd Todrick Barnett, who is chief judge in the 4th Judicial District, which encompasses Hennepin County and Minneapolis. We have John Choi, who is the elected county attorney in Ramsey County, which encompasses uh, St. Paul. We also have Dan Liu, who is the Chief Public Defender up in the 6th Judicial District, which is the Duluth area of the state. And we have Ebony Ruland, who is Professor of Criminal Justice at the University of Cincinnati. And if you're wondering why we called in someone from Cincinnati, it's because she's a native Minnesotan. And I'm proud to say that she was once the research director for us here at the Robina Institute. So we're here to talk today about racial disparities. I'm going to start us off with a few words and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel right away so that we can really get into this discussion. Um, this, this, this session is called the Minnesota Paradox and I guess the first place to start is with what that means. And what it means is Minnesota has one of the largest, the highest standards of living in the country. It's evidenced by great high education levels, income, the presence of, of multiple uh, corporate headquarters, a vibrant art scene. But underneath all of these achievements, we also have some of the largest racial inequities um, in the state where people who are black, Native American, Hispanic, Asian, may experience lower mm -hmm. income, higher unemployment, uh, lower educational outcomes, and higher rates of incarceration. That is the Minnesota paradox. Minnesota is a great place to live if you're white. So today we're gonna to focus on what those inequities look like in the criminal justice system. And to sort of center us on that discussion, I'm gonna show you a few um, statistics from sentencing. I told you that my you know, area of expertise is sentencing, so I'm gonna look at the back end of the system and kind of show you uh, what those disparities look like on the back end. So this is, this chart is a snapshot from 2018. And the first column shows the, the racial breakdown for the general population. And you can see that for the most part in Minnesota, most people who live here are white. 84% of the population is white. 6% uh, are black, 2% are Native American. That number is, is su such a small piece of that bar that you can't even read the number. 5% um, are uh, Hispanic and 5% are Asian. When you move to the second column on this chart though, this is the number, this is the racial breakdown of people who've been convicted of felony offenses. And you can see that the proportion of people who are black and Native American has increased dramatically. It doesn't look like our population anymore. And then you move over to the adult prison population, which is the farthest bar on the right, and the numbers get even more disparate with 36% of that population being black, 10% being a Native American. So I'm not saying that I would expect all three bars to look exactly equal, but I sure would expect them to look closer to that first bar than they do. So there's something going on you know, between, in between uh, all of these decision points. And unfortunately, this isn't a new phenomenon. This chart shows the racial breakdown of people who've been convicted of felonies since the beginning of the guidelines back in 1981. And the, so the white portion on this chart is a proportion of, of our population convicted of felonies who are white. Uh, that's the blue portion, I'm sorry. The green bar are the proportion who are black. And you can see that the, the proportion of people who were black with, within this population really began to grow and expand in the 1990s. And that's where Minnesota, just like uh, every other state uh, started to enact policies that were tougher on crime. Um, sorry, one, I got out of something there. That, that started to enact policies that were tougher on crime. So um, 
especially with regard to, to drug crimes. Now I'm looking at a chart of the racial breakdown of people by judicial district. And um, so Minnesota is organized into 10 judicial districts. The couple that I wanna call out on this chart are the second and the fourth. Uh, in those two locations, that's Ramsey County and Hennepin County, that's St. Paul and, and Minneapolis again, about half of the population of people who were convicted of felonies are black. If you look over at the sixth and the ninth judicial districts, that's the northern half of our state, uh, running from Duluth all the way over to East Grand Forks. That's where we have our, the majority of our tribal lands. And you can see that in those areas, 20 to 30% of people who are convicted of felonies are Native American. The last number that I'm going to call out to sort of paint this picture of what, what a disparity looks like in, in our criminal justice system is revocation rates. This is people who've been given a probation sentence um, but weren't unsuccessful and they were ultimately revoked to prison. The top uh, line on this graph is people who are Native American and we can see that they are revoked at much higher rates than people of all other races at times on this graph. The, the revocation rate for them is up you know, 10 percent percentage points or more greater than for, for other people, uh, people of other races. So I, I put all of this out there just to sort of paint a picture of what, um, what things look like here in, in Minnesota. But none of it tells us why things look that way. So, so that's really where I would like to start our conversation this morning. And I'd like to throw that out to the panel. How do you think we got here? Um, what might explain the disparities that we see? And if it's okay, Judge Barnett, I'd like to start with you on that question. All right, thanks for having me. Um, I think that uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, there is um, overt discrimination in that system, although it has diminished over the last uh, several decades. But uh, even from the slides, we can see that we continue to deal with that uh, perception of and the reality of the unfairness in our criminal justice system. Uh, but there's many factors, I think, that contribute to how we got here from policing to sentencing. But the thing that we see um, play out every day in the courtroom uh, has a lot to do with the person's criminal history or prior conviction uh, doing plea bargaining and sentencing. And so if you think about it, um, people of color are more likely uh, to be detained uh, pre-trial. And we know that uh, those people who are detained pre-trial and, and waiting for their trial are more likely to plead guilty. They're more likely to be sentenced to prison and have longer sentences. Um, and we know those people are color of our color. And so, you know, that plays out, even though it's not overt discrimination, uh, we see those disparities. And two other areas I'd like to mention um, that we can't ignore uh, when we're talking about uh, prior convictions or criminal history is that that person's juvenile record or history does follow them into adult court. Um, and that can be a factor that people don't talk about. And the other thing is just that consequences of felony convictions that uh, impact housing and voting and employment. So um, that's just some of the ways that I think we got here. Thanks, I, I appreciate that. And I, I want to ask John Choi to respond next. Before I do that real quickly, I, I forgot to say at the beginning, we will have a Q&A at the end. So folks, as we go, if you want to uh, chat your questions and put your questions in the chat, we'll, we'll address as many as we can when we get uh, towards the end of the broadcast here today. Uh, but John Choi, what, how do you think we got here? And I think you're muted right now. All right. Thank you for that question. And, uh, and thank you for, uh, to the organizers of pulling uh, this really important conversation together. But I think the, the first uh, question that you pose is a really important one. And first, I want to call out the fact that um, we as a society have become much more aware of where we are at. If you ask this question 10 years ago, I think our general society 
uh, would have said, uh, what are you talking about? Where are we? Because in many instances, I think as I reflect back on my time as the county attorney when I first ran for office in 2010, uh, quite frankly, I think I could have said anything that I wanted to as long as I had some pictures uh, that would show me with police officers and things of that sort. And there wasn't much thinking or engagement um, by the general society about the criminal justice system. Today, I think there has been an evolution in the interest of uh, our community about what is happening in our criminal justice system. And I think people are coming uh, to this uh, important conclusion that they're not liking it. We're seeing mass uh, incarceration. We're seeing massive racial disparities. We see a, an assembly line system of justice where we try to impose a one size fits all into everything. We rely very much on systems and we assume that policing and systems can lead us to public safety when we have disinvested, I think, from our communities. And so as we think about how we got here, I think the, the tough pill for all of us, and we have to swallow, swallow it, is that we all have to acknowledge whether we're in the system, uh, in a system that uh, I think actually has historical roots uh, to uh, slavery and, and racism from the beginning of our country, um, and for the people who oversee it. And we have to remind ourselves that our systems, whether it's policing or whether it's our courts, we are all subject to the people. Uh, but the people for very much, for a very long time, for decades, um, have not really paid attention to what's been happening. I always say that the criminal justice system uh, is not broken. It's actually designed to do exactly what it's been doing. And as more and more people are recognizing what is happening, uh, we're coming to a reckoning uh, that things really need to change because there are lots of inequities uh, in the system. And so I think that's where kind of where it's where it starts in terms of um, the answer to that question of uh, how did we get here? It all started with all of us. But as we today are uh, being more intentional about trying to unpack some of this, I think that um, in the name of reform, um, I think what we'll continue to do unless we are very intentional about this is that we'll continue to tinker with the system that exists. You know, we inherited the system. Nobody that works in systems today came to work and said, this is what we're going to do. We, we were told this is what we're supposed to do to achieve justice, to achieve public safety. And as we think about that, and then what we do in terms of the name of reform, we think about creating exit ramps, so like diversion programs or whatnot, or treatment court. We think about maybe the entrance ramp, and we think about maybe not charging certain cases. But really, what we really fundamentally need to do is think about transforming the entire system in terms of how policing happens in our communities and how we engage those communities in terms of uh, the solutions. So I'll just stop there, and, and I know I'll have other opportunities to expand on that. That's a great comments. Thank you. Um, Dan, I, what, what do you think? How did we get here? Thanks for having me, and it's great to be with this group of folks. As we start asking that question, exploring how we got here, you know, I, it's very powerful to listen to our, a chief judge, an elected county attorney. Yet for me, as I look outside my window, uh, I'm four blocks away from a memorial that is 100 years to this date three African-American men came to Duluth as circus workers, wrongfully accused of raping a white woman, deposited at the jail, and what happens? An angry mob of 10,000 break these three men out of jail and lynch Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee. And that's in Minnesota. That's in our what place we call home. So when we ask how we got here, what has the angry crowd of 10,000, which maybe many of our neighbors, where, where have we gone in the last decade? Well, we know that we have disparity 
and you've seen it in Minnesota, yet as you look at it, we are 5% of the world's population, we know, and we incarcerate now closer to 30% of all those who sit in prison. So really, when you ask how we got here, how did we take the few? There are very few folks of color and indigenous neighbors in our state. And how did we make them the many? The many who are in the backseat of squad cars, the many who are in our jail, our courthouse, and our prison. And if you look at it, uh, when you look at how we got here, it was many elected folks and appointed folks who, who exercise their judgment. Look at this graph of mental health hospitals in the last decade. And look at the growth of prisons. Again, folks exercising discretion. Now, how we got here? Look what we haven't considered in our neighbors and our communities of color. Let's consider what harms human beings. So I think as we ask how we got here, we need to seriously give consideration to what has been driving all this incarceration. And of course, I can't leave my time without talking about probably one of the top drivers of our work and that substance use disorder. Have we over-criminalized? Have we turned folks who struggle with substance use, trauma in life, mental health, and have we taken the few and made them the many? So I, I look forward to the, the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Ebony, what do you, what would you like to add to that conversation? Yeah, so I think the point that um, I'm hearing or that I'll summarize is that we got here from many different points. And so if we look, we, we got here from historical, going all the way back from slavery to Jim Crow laws. We got here from how society deals with problems as uh, substance abuse, mental illness. We got here by the um, number of laws that we have on our books that I think we really have to question, you know, should some of these things be laws? I think we need to have conversations about decriminalization, some of decriminalizing some of the things that we have on our books. And we got here um, for uh, the ways in which police officers sort of are called to respond to different um, crimes or different uh, societal ills. And so that first point of contact, which happens with the law enforcement and then carries all the way through the criminal justice system um, is, is really important. So I'll, I, I guess to say that is we got here through many different means. And so to solve this problem, it can't just lie within the criminal justice system. We have to attack it from all different areas, from mental illness, substance abuse, education, and, and really grappling with our history as the other panelists have said. Right. I think earlier today, you know, I, I pointed out the point that you just made about, to, to some degree, is our policies as well, right? Um, I, I showed that, that some of the racial disparity really took off when we started to enact tough on crime laws in, in the 1990s. And what's neat about having all of you on this, on this, panel, on this panel is that you all occupy different perspectives um, within the criminal justice system. So what I'm wondering is from where you stand, are there particular policies or practices that you think could be contributing to racial disparity? And uh, Dan, I'd like to call on you for this one first. As we look and consider the policies and the practices, we gotta recognize and we gotta own that their folks who come to us come because someone exercised discretion. Someone made that choice. And yes, John's absolutely right. It starts with the policing on the front end, but then it comes through to a charging decision 
and then it drives right through to our judicial branch and our judges. And as we look at some of the policies where we've exercised discretion uh, and we need to keep considering, do we really need to continue to criminalize the mentally ill? Do we need to continue to criminalize substance use? Do we have the courageous elected officials to say that trace amounts of drugs need to come to us? where we offer folks a lifetime of harm once they see us. We offer folks a lifetime of homelessness, the inability to work and go to school. And ultimately, we also need to look at uh, the discretion. Uh, and we have to consider, do we continue to allow this massive amounts of arrest? That's a challenge as we look at policies. John, Choi, do you have, what, what's your perspective on this? Do you see policies and practices? I mean, do you think it's mental illness and substance mm -hmm. abuse as Dan? I just laid out or, or would you say something different from your experience? And I think you might be muted. I keep doing that and apologies again, but as we uh, answer this question and think about policies, absolutely they're, they're uh, important um, and Dan uh, talked a little bit about discretion, that people actually do have discretion within uh, the criminal justice system and to think about how we exercise that. But before I delve into this, I want to also make it really clear that just based upon my uh, many years of experience that culture uh, will eat policy for lunch on any given day. So I think in many ways, it really starts with this notion, especially in, in my swim lane of prosecutors and in law enforcement, that we need people who enforce our laws uh, to be better connected to our communities that we serve. And we have to remind ourselves every day that we serve uh, the people. And we, as a matter of race equity, need to be more intentional about connecting with communities that are most impacted I think for too long, uh, my uh, sector or profession of prosecution, uh, we have put an over-reliance on doing uh, right uh, for the victim. And I think there are gaps in terms of how we actually understand how communities or many of the victims are with respect to crime in terms of uh, what they actually want uh, from, uh, in terms of what kind of public safety they want, what kind of system that they want, and really, we. Uh, tend to make these decisions ourselves without really engaging uh, those particular communities. And so I think it's really critical that we reckon with that fact that that hasn't been happening. And in order for these things to actually change, I mean, I can come up with a number of policies and I've been doing that. Um, but the reality is, is that um, every time I do that business, it's going to mean that it plays out across uh, the system as I would like. But I do believe that the prosecutor has uh, one of the most important roles in the system because they are the front door of the criminal justice system uh, as it relates to whether or not it gets into court. Uh, obviously, there's something that happens before that, which is policing, but I also believe that the prosecutor uh, can't have influence over um, what happens in policing. Uh, so we're looking at a number of policies in this area we've enacted, you know, where we, right now, we are charging fifth degree uh, drug possession cases. Um, obviously, that's not very popular with the police, uh, but at the same time, uh, it tries to further my belief that these lower level drug possession uh, cases should not be criminalized and we need to find better and different outcomes. Uh, but at the same time, um, you're going to have people who are going to uh, see it in a different way. And that what I'm doing is that we're actually substituting the judgment of the legislative branch and coming up with our own laws. Uh, that's just a part of the messy part of reform, and we're going to continue to do those things. I'm really 
excited about some work that we're going to be doing around traffic stops. I believe that uh, the prosecutor can play a very important role, at least to say that, listen, uh, with respect to the pretextual traffic stops, um, we don't like them, and we can have a higher level of protection for the citizens of uh, at least Ramsey County and hopefully maybe other parts of the state. Uh, so there are things that we certainly can do uh, with respect to that front door, um, and the prosecutor needs to embrace that. I would love to see more police embrace the notion that they, too, have discretion. They can come up with ways to uh, not arrest somebody and actually have them booked into jail, but they can bring them to maybe a place where they're going to be uh, getting some assistance instead. Uh, there are strategies, uh, for instance, law enforcement assisted diversion that I would love to see more police uh, embrace. And at the same time, this, this assembly line form of justice that we have uh, inherited and perpetuated. Uh, we need to stop that. And we have this notion that the adversarial system uh, brings us the truth and justice. And I think we need to find different ways. We need to question the system that we currently have inherited and we continue to perpetuate. Think about different ways. I think restorative practices are a better way of engaging community uh, to help resolve some of these issues. Um, and I also think that we need to be thinking about on the, on the back end in terms of post-conviction, uh, because we don't care uh, enough about like, what happens in prison and not understanding that really sending someone to prison actually causes immense harm. And we need to better recognize what's happening and what isn't happening in prison and really start making uh, better decisions about whether or not someone should go to prison just because the guidelines say that you should doesn't necessarily mean that that is the best uh, particular outcome. Just in Ramsey County alone, uh, since 2013, we've had a 47% decrease in the numbers of people that we have sent to prison. Uh, in 2013, we sent 1,226 people to prison. In 2019, it was 652. And I know next year it will be a lot lower. And that runs contrary to what the statewide trends in across uh, for the vast, vast majority of uh, judicial districts across the state. But it's about saying those things out loud that we want to actually not over incarcerate and that having so many people, especially uh, those who are black and brown in our prison system, is not a good thing. Um, and so those are the things that I would say that we need to start doing. And that's one of the reasons we haven't been doing it across this nation and across the state that we need to get better connected to. Um, so I'll just stop there, and I know we'll have other opportunities to talk more, but those are kind of my thoughts on that. Those are those are some really interesting thoughts. I mean, both both uh, both you, John, and Dan, you talked a lot about points of discretion, and I think that was the point of that question was. Where, you, where do you have that discretion to make change and to rethink um, what our policies need to be? And John, you talked about being the front door, but the reality is that the real front door is, is on the police end, it's arrests, right? The, if the arrest is never made in the first place, then, then you're, not gonna, you're not gonna see that person. So I'd like to move to, to Ebony and, and ask you about the policing side of this equation. I mean, there's, especially in, in Minneapolis, there's been a lot of talk about defunding the police. Is, is that the answer or, or should we be thinking about something else? So I think that's a, a really good question. And I think that the word defund is turning some people off, but I think it's an important question. And I think we need to have this conversation. And I sort of talk about it as reallocating resources. So if we look at uh, policing, and a lot of people don't really understand what policing police officers do. They think that they're constantly responding to these violent crimes and that, you know, if we defund the um, police that, you know, violence will run rampant. But if we really look at what police officers do, they are constantly responding to radio calls. And this is a complaint that I hear in my work that I do around policing, that they're just chasing the radio calls. And a lot of those radio calls are more nuisance things. Like, you know, people are, you know, shooting fireworks or dogs are barking or somebody hasn't picked up their trash. So if we look at the totality of what police do, a lot of it isn't that, you know, stuff we see on Law and Order or CSI. It's really these, you know, common problems. So I think that it is an interesting conversation. And I think that we do need to look at reallocating 
resources away from uh, police into more so that we can deal with the mental health um, aspects, the substance abuse aspect. And I think that people, when, when people are experiencing mental illness and they're experiencing, um, uh, when they're being triggered by that, they don't know who else to call but the police. And so if we can give them other resources, other maybe social workers who can handle that um, or other community-based agencies who can handle that, I think that actually makes policing better in the long run because policing, police officers can then focus on those um, crimes we want them to focus on, the homicides, the rapes. We can, we can dedicate more resources so that officers can focus on that and less time focusing more on those nuisance types of calls. And then the other point I wanna make is this discretion where I think police officers um, do realize that they have discretion and sometimes when we talk about this issue, we're talking about it in terms of policing and we're talking about it in terms of community. But my work really focuses on looking at different aspects of community. Where um, I worked on a study with Hennepin County, um, this was in the early 2000s, and we were looking at, this is when uh, disproportionate minority contact. And we were looking at why the juvenile detention center had more African Americans and why we saw these racial disparities. Well, when we looked further, when we peeled back the layers, we realized that officers in Minnetonka were utilizing their discretion. So kids, it's not that kids don't get in trouble in Minnetonka or Eden Prairie. It's that when they get in trouble, they drive them home, you know, and they tell their parents. Whereas if they get in trouble in Minneapolis, then the discretion was to bring them to the detention center. Now, I understand those policies have changed um, as we're looking at uh, decreasing disparities in detention. But I think this, uh, this, this, conversation around defunding police or you know having police do things differently that does happen in certain communities where police officers do police differently and they don't um you know arrest every single type of crime like spitting on the sidewalk that we see in other types of communities so i think these conversations happen in certain communities but then when we're talking about other communities that are disproportionately african-american disproportionately native american and experience more crime then we're, you know, it's, oh, we can't have that. But again, let's look at what police do the majority of their time. And I think the conversation would be different. It's really, really helpful. You know, I, I mentioned um, sort of continuing on this uh, sort of policy and discretion train of thought. I mentioned early on uh, that, that I'm currently the chair of the, the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. And so when I think about uh, this issue of racial disparities, you know, I thought about what I could do in, in that role. And, it, you know, it dawned on me that uh, the, the thing I had power over was the actual sentencing guidelines themselves. So um, in two meetings ago, I, I called for the commission to begin a review of our policies for, for racial impact. So I, I wanna look at, at every guideline and I wanna uh, measure whether uh, people who are black or Native American or Asian are, are disproportionately impacted by each one of those guidelines. And if we find that, then I think we have to ask ourselves, uh, is that a justifiable difference? And do is, is it important for us to, to continue that guideline or is the harm worse than the good that we think that we're, we're putting forth with that guideline? So that's what we're gonna be doing. That's what I feel like I can do to try to reverse the trend of um, disparate disparity in, in our criminal justice system. And I'm wondering from all of you, what do you think you can do? And especially coming from the role that you're in. So Judge Barnett, I'd really like to start with you. What do you think as a judge you can do to reverse racial disparity in our, in our criminal justice system? Well, you know, um, just recently being elected chief judge, um, I think that um, it's important for me to lead our district. You know, we have 63 uh, judges and about 14 referees and over 500 employees. So I think it's important for me as the leader uh, to lead our group in acknowledging that we have some cystic uh, racism that exists in our system. We have to acknowledge that. And then like you, uh, one of the things that um, we've started doing uh, and in the process of doing is to look at our own policies that we have, you know, look at our procedures and processes and where there's disparities, we have to find a way to change that. 
Um, and so what I think uh, when we're talking about this, I, what I think is really encouraging that um, we really hasn't seen before, although I think we work very collaboratively uh, with our justice partners, but one of the things that I really see that is happening now is that our justice partners in Hennepin County are, are moving towards this, I guess, journey for racial equality, you know, that we're, that they're willing to work collaboratively for actual change, for action, that we're not, you know, admiring this issue like we have in the past. We're not just talking about it, but we're starting to say, hey, we're, not only where can we change as an agency or an organization or anything like that, but also, as a system, how can we change these disparities? And so I'm very encouraged by that uh, more than I've ever been. So when you say, what can we do? I think I can help in that as the chief judge. As a judge, of course, um, you know, we have to, you know, acknowledge in the courtroom when we see um, things play out uh, in an evidentiary hearing where there is a bad arrest, we have to acknowledge that it's a bad arrest and uh, and uh, dismiss the case. We've done that in the past, and I think that's something that we'll continue to do. But we, I think, have a responsibility um, to acknowledge uh, when we see things happening, whether it's by the police, prosecutor, defense attorneys, uh, when we see things that are perpetuating disparities, I think we have an obligation to point those out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Choi, what can you do as a prosecutor? Well, there's, I think there's so many things that the prosecutor can do. And I'll be the first to admit that I used to be a prosecutor uh, that believed that the role that we could play with respect to race disparity was somewhat limited because you can get very overwhelmed uh, with uh, the fact that many of this, all, a lot of this starts with the, how we do policing. Uh, also, too, we're talking about, in many instances, under-resourced uh, communities uh, and dealing with all of these things that seem to be outside of my swim lane in my area of influence. But I have come to believe that, um, that it's just really critical for all of us, wherever we lie in the system and within uh, our community, to be doing everything that we can and to start seeing uh, those opportunities. Judge Barnett talked about um, one area particularly is just the role of um, uh, anybody that can play if you have power in the system is to uh, exercise your discretion and your standing or your ability to speak uh, to call out uh, areas of injustice or to um, so in that case for the prosecutor so for instance we can have a higher standard of how we might think about charging a case. If we have dubious constitutional issues and there are uh, uh, things that are questionable, we shouldn't always be relying solely on the police narrative. And I think it's incumbent upon prosecutors to not just say that, well, I guess we'll have those issues litigated later, but clearly there's probable cause based upon the facts. So in terms of how we might charge a case, it's that concept that the, the prosecutor has to be independent of the police. I think in addition to that, and I mentioned this before about connecting prosecution uh, to the communities that we serve and to make sure that we're actually making, doing, being very intentional about reaching out to um, impacted communities, but not just reaching out, but to share our power in co-design. Uh, no longer, I think it's really effective for just like the, 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 the system actor to go into a room and come out with a solution because oftentimes those solutions have actually not worked. And so we need to engage communities and do a lot of co-design work. Right now we're in the process of um, reimagining youth justice. It's been a process that's been going on for uh, almost two years now, but we have weekly conversations with uh, impacted community members and we're actually reconfiguring uh, and designing something different, completely different than our current juvenile justice system, uh, where we are thinking about actually uh, allowing for community members to help the prosecutor actually make a charging decision so that 
as we think about the information that we get, it's not solely based upon what the police present to us, but there are other things. The public defender is an equal partner uh, in this initiative uh, to share kind of our, our uh, decision making in terms of who gets charged uh, in the juvenile system or petitioned in the juvenile system. And then to also share that decision making with the community as it relates to uh, how do we uh, make uh, amends uh, with respect to the situation? How do we make the victim whole uh, to allow for a community to be a part of that? And most importantly, that it's we're reaching out and uh, empowering uh, impacted community members to be uh, a part of that uh, decision making. I think that's something that um, I'm really looking forward to be able to talk about more uh, in the coming months, but we've put a lot of time and effort and we developed a lot of partnerships uh, working at the national level and here locally to uh, to move that forward. It sounds like you have quite a lot on your plate as usual. Um, Ebony, as a professor uh, who's teaching the next generation of people who are going to be working in our criminal justice system, what do you think you can do to try to reverse racial disparities? So I think that I can make sure that our students are um, being prepared, that we're having these hard conversations about why uh, um, racial disparities exist and where they generate from. Um, I think that as universities are doing throughout the country, um, and I know the University of Minnesota is doing this as well, looking at our curric curriculum and making sure that uh, students who wanna be officers um, are we're giving them you know a curriculum that's going to prepare them for this that they understand the systemic and the societal um, ills and that they don't go out and per, um, pe perpetuate that and I think also making sure that there's ongoing continuous education because we see that you know a lot of students say they we and we were all students too we we but then we come become part of the system and we and we you know become part of those same sort of problems so I think we need to make sure that this is ongoing and not one-time conversations and that you know we're holding policymakers accountable through the research and we're constantly evaluating this and, and um, researching these topics so that, again, I've been doing this work a long time. I've been on many, many panels and you know, 20, 15 years later, we're still having these conversations. And so somehow we've got to move it forward. And I think that's by just kind of staying on it. Uh, that's my thoughts. Okay. All right. And, and Dan, you're the last but not least on this particular question. From the defense perspective, what, what can you do to try to reverse these disparities? What we can keep doing is be the warriors to, yes, conjole, share power, demand that our elected officials, our judiciary, have courage. We can support those who have courage and be partners. We know how we reduce disparity. Make the few, not the many. But it will take courage. It will take the courage like Judge Barnett will do and say, no, no, that's, we can't keep detaining people forever on a traffic stop or on an encounter. It will take the courage, like our elected county attorneys, including John, to say, no, we're not going to criminalize the person with trace amounts with a needle in his or her arm near death using subs substances. And we also have a role to share that power and to begin those partnerships. One of the things that we're really proud of is we looked at where we had incredible numbers of community of color and our in indigenous neighbors uh, and where their lives have become unglued. And you know what that is? It's retail theft we looked at we found where they came from and it came from our grocery stores folks are stealing because they're hungry and we created and we worked on in partnership with the grocer 
that instead of a police call, it was a pre-charge diversion. We looked at the sheer number of warrants that are issued where we lock folks up, small offenses, big offenses, probation violations, and we know what that invites. That invites a police encounter where people are touched where they shouldn't be touched and they meet us all. Uh, and we found warrant resolution programs. Many communities are doing it. That's how we begin, I hope, to reduce the sheer number of folks that we label criminal. So one of our audience members actually raised a question that I think you just highlighted pretty well, uh, Dan. And so I wanna ask it and, and, and sort of open it up for anyone to respond to this question. So the, the question is, attorney at Choi mentioned a one size fits all system, but can he or others address the reality of actually there being two separate systems, one that punishes black and native Americans and another that punishes everyone else? Does anyone have a reaction to that? that they'd like to share? Right, I think the, the slides demonstrate that we have uh, different forms of justice uh, in terms of uh, policing, courts, all of that. Um, when I was talking about the one size fits all uh, system is that we just assume, we make these assumptions about what we do, that somehow it all works and it all gears towards basically the police are out there doing their enforcement and we are a complaint based system and they generally speaking will be in areas where there's supposedly more crime or where the correct calls are coming from. They then do investigations. They put it onto uh, uh, the conveyor belt. The prosecutor does their part in that system. Um, and there's a baked in assumption that if there's probable cause that a case is charged or if there's some diversion, maybe that could happen. And then we litigate that case um, or there's plea negotiations, plea bargaining, that's a vast, vast majority, but that's another long discussion uh, that we could go into. And then we have the sentencing guidelines that we utilize and, and then that results into some, potentially some prison or probation type of outcome. And we put, and we just assume that that is the way to truth, public safety and justice. And we just make everybody go through that. We've never had, uh, I think, deep enough thoughts about whether or not we could have something very different. And so when I talk about that one size fits all, uh, we just assume that everything is gonna be taken care of, but actually people are presented into the system and we gotta start thinking about these notions of human dignity to see people uh, as people, not for what they have done. We may not like what they have done, uh, but they're human beings and we need to ground ourselves in that. Everybody in the system needs to do that, but people all will need something different. They present with mental health issues, drug addiction, et cetera, and it should require actually complex types of responses that are very, very different. Somehow we came to this conclusion that the way to do it all is to put somebody into a, a box uh, which would be a prison cell. And so somehow that's the way to, to, to find justice or to work towards that. And I think there are other things, other models that we should be thinking about uh, as a nation, as a state, and as a community. And Judge Barnett, earlier you talked about um, Hennepin County, that there being indicators in Hennepin County showing an interest in, in meaningfully moving racial justice forward. So I'm sort of hearing, you know, maybe that the, you're seeing signs that, that John's, what John just described as thinking about new ways of doing things is a real possibility. Um, one, of our, one of our listeners has asked, you know, what can you elaborate on that? Like, what are the signals that you're receiving that, that, that give you that, that, that impression? Well, remember, this is my 29th day as chief judge, so <laughs> let's start there. Uh, but here's what I'll say. When the county administrator, David Huffs, calls you and to congratulate you, and the next sentence out of his mouth is, okay, what are we going to do 
after the death of George Floyd? What, what ideas do you have? How can I help? Todd, we have all these agencies in Hennepin County. We should be working together, not separately. So what can we do together in Hennepin County? And it, and it was a great conversation about um, uh, bringing more diversity in the workforce, because I think that the court could do a better job there. And I think Hennepin County is doing uh, a good job in, in that uh, there's things we could do together. But um, those preliminary conversations um, about how can I help you? And it's, it's something that I didn't have to bring up. Um, and he brought that forward. I think that's where I have encouragement when um, I'm talking to other elected officials and have meetings coming up with other people that have contacted me to say, how can I help? What can we do? I think those are the indicators to me that is just not talk that people want some action. Because I think that's what the citizens uh, here in Minnesota want. I think uh, um, around the United States and internationally, they're tired of the talk and they want action. And so um, I'm encouraged by people who can make significant decisions coming forward to say, what can we do to change? Yeah, that definitely is encouraging, you know, and along that, I, along that, uh, the thread of change, one change that we've all experienced uh, immensely over the past couple of months is, is COVID-19. And as a result of that, you know, our criminal justice system has had to change the way of doing business. Uh, our jail populations have been reduced dramatically. Our prison populations have been reduced because we've made deliberate choices about, about who we place in, in those facilities because of the risks to their health. Um, so one of our listeners is asking, um, what could we do to keep those changes moving forward beyond on the other side of COVID? Is there anyone who would be willing to respond to that? I would uh, take a stab at that just very quickly. Um, in Ramsey County, uh, we used to have about 400 people uh, in jail pre-conviction. Uh, today, we've reduced that number by a, a, a high of about 54%, and I think we're probably about 50% right now as we speak. But a big part of our strategy to um, think about how we sustain uh, those outcomes is actually thinking about like uh, imposing um, more uh, discretion, use of discretion with respect to the authority that the sheriff and the prosecutor has. So just because a law enforcement agency brings somebody down to the detention center, it doesn't mean that we have to allow them to come into our jail. And so for over the past year, we've had a committee working on this. Uh, we haven't announced this yet, but we've gotten a, a big um, kind of a, a, infused, a f infusion of technical assistance and resources from the Arnold Foundation, uh, where we're working on a project where we're going to figure out ways to utilize the, the discretion of the jailer uh, to not only maintain uh, some of the outcomes that we've had in Ramsey County, but really try to get to go a little bit deeper and to partner with community to resource community so that they can help people uh, who um, are encountering the justice system and we can figure out ways to um, uh, divert them away and get them the treatment and the resources that they might need. And I'll just add, I think the COVID question is very important and something that people should definitely research and evaluate. Um, I'm not so convinced that, um, you know, I'm kind of uh, skeptical because my other work is in probation. And I know that, you know, probation has just sort of shifted in some sites by putting electronic home monitoring on them, you know, making them call in. So we're still a very punitive society that we just might have shifted to more um, community based sanctions, which again, as we can argue is better than prison. Um, but I think that's why we still have to be cautiously optimistic that yes, COVID might have shifted um, some things, but, you know, we've we're just very punitive. And so I think we probably just shifted the ways in which we um, are punished people. 
And I, and I know from experience that you're also working on a fines and fees project right now. So I assume that one of the reasons you're concerned about that shift to community monitoring is that it might impose additional fines and fees on that individual to have to pay for that monitoring. Is that right? Correct. And also just delay that will say, okay, due to COVID, we're just going to pause it. But then once COVID's over, all that, all those fees and fines are owed and all of that stuff. So exactly. Kelly, could I add? Yeah. Last two months, law enforcement has had the ability to show incredible restraint in the sheer number of bookings. I think John's talked about the reduction in Ramsey. In many jails, it's 50%. We've demonstrated in a short period of time that we can dramatically reduce the many that's led to disparity in our jails. We have the courage to do it. The real, the real question is, can it be more than two months as we struggle with disease, death, and police rioting? And that's, that's the challenge for all of us in every community. That's a good point. So we are getting close to the end of our time. Uh, I want to put one one more question out there, and then and then I'll ask if anyone has any any parting thoughts before we go. We have a lot of students who are joining us on this webinar today as well. And so the the last question that I want to ask of the panel is the same one I asked of you all a few minutes ago. What can students do to help uh, reverse the disparities that we see in our criminal justice system? Um, and I, maybe I'll turn to Ebony to answer that one first, since you're the professor. Well, I would just say what I said earlier, you know, that once you become part of the system, you know, I work with a lot of uh, students who want to be officers, who want to be lawyers, and then they just get into the system and they, you know, become part of that system. So I think you got to keep the enthusiasm that you have once you're, a, you know, one, as you're a student, you got to keep that enthusiasm um, long term. And then also, I think, well, I'll just leave it at that. It's a long, it's a long answer, but I, I would just say keep the keep being enthusiastic and keep being involved in these issues and keep understanding why these issues exist. exist. So I guess self education and, and being amongst the community. I think somebody said that. You know, you have to if you if you don't live with the community or interact with the community, it's e easy to see the community as criminals or as others. Um, so just staying connected with the communities and community based organizations. That's a good, that's a good answer. Dan, did you have any thoughts on this question? Kelly, I think for many of our students listening, and I'm told there are many hundreds of them, uh, as you go through these next months and into the year, and yes, search for work, and that's going to be hard to find. You know, I think all of us will be up front with you and tell you that. Use this time. Don't admire, don't be angry at the data. Don't be angry at the world we live in. Use this time to take your energy and talent. And instead of going to the white shoe law firm for our law students, or to find the consulting company for some of our other students, or look for that magical lab, find that time. Go explore where the nonprofits are in your community that serve folks of color and our, indi on our indigenous neighbors and be called to action. As we remember Congressman John Lewis's incredible life this week, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for the many of you who uh, hold the keys to solutions, it's time for you to go and stir some good trouble and help make our tomorrows better. Thank you. All right, we have about a minute to go. And so I wanted to throw it out to Judge Barnett or John Choi. Do you have in like 30 seconds, any parting words for, for our group today? I would just add that um, the criminal justice system and everything that we do belongs to you. So, what I would say is continue to demand um, information and answers, educate yourself about our outcomes in the justice system, develop relationship uh, with those people that you elect, your county prosecutor, 
Um, you can also, I think, chief judges uh, would talk to members of the community um, and get to know the people in those systems and, and be involved. And of course, um, if you uh, anybody is interested in becoming a public defender or prosecutor, uh, more than ever, we need uh, very passionate people to be a part of, uh, I think, what are going to be some really good and important things that are going to happen in our future. Judge Barnett? I agree with what uh, Dan said earlier uh, by quoting um, John Lewis, and that's never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble. It's necessary trouble. Um, and so I just encourage the students to go out and get involved in the community like other people have said and uh, affect change. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me in this conversation today. I, I, I really enjoyed hearing from you. I thought you had some great wisdom to impart. And, you know, of course, we don't have the solutions, I, but as uh, was said many times, we all have to be part of the solution. Uh, and with that, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you.